now the dilemma is, it gets back to that whole authenticity question. So I want to say stuff that's truly me, that's also truly relevant. Um, and I think one of the dilemmas that we run into with, with communication in general, but I think this kind of communication in particular, is you, you want to be honest and you want to say enough, but you can never say it all. Right? So words reveal truth, but they never tell the whole story. So one of the other things that I really encourage, and this is where the, the idea of hashtags and creating communities, creating sticky ideas that people can share, um, <coughs> it's important, I think, to find your community, your tribe of people. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why, you know, on Twitter people say it's important for you to follow people who are part of your community. When someone follows you, there's an encouragement to follow them back as well. Um, to say, yeah, this, this is a reciprocal relationship. I'm willing to, to hear what you have to say as well, if you're willing to hear what I have to say. Uh, and over time, you start to realize, yeah, there's a real synergy here. I'm you know, bouncing ideas off with you, and, and um, that gives me an opportunity to hear what's going on. Um, some Twitter users you know, really see that as being part of their community. They've created an online community of their people. Other Twitter users don't care a lick about what anybody else has to say. Um, and there are people who are able to you know, successfully and effectively use Twitter both ways. Um, another thing that Twitter has developed um, over the past maybe 18 months is groups. So um, if I'm following Julie, and Julie is the communications coordinator, is that your mm -hmm. title, for RCC, Julie could create an RCC group on Twitter. And anyone can look at that group and say, who's a member of that group? And these are the people who she's following who are part of that little tribe, right? So you can take your, I don't know, your choir. And okay, the choir is you know, going to have a, a group. And so you can follow all the people who are part of your choir, and, or your Sunday school class, or your whatever, your missions trip, or your pastor's lunch group or whatever it is, and you can then follow all of those people, and it's, it creates a way of kind of like turning channels, so I can listen to my, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist, and I'm a father, and I'm a Nashvilleian, and I'm a Presbyterian, and I'm a guy whose last name is Voss, and I'm Dutch, and I like soccer, and so I can grab all these different groups and say, these, these are my soccer people, and these are my, you know, uh, political people, and these are my national people, um, and you can listen on those different channels to kind of put the feelers out, well, what's going on over here? What's going on in this discussion? Uh, so that's another way that I think you can um, make the noise work for you in a better way. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, uh, the interest in Egypt and the Arab yeah. Spring. One of my columns, I use an application called TweetDeck. Mm -hmm. You can see different columns of different stuff on how the mm -hmm. Middle East Movements group in Twitter, mm -hmm. where Andrew Carvin and various people that he's mm -hmm. I, I typically, I mean, I, I basically just started following him and then started following the people that he was following. Yeah. That showed up in that. Yep. In those tweets, so. Yep. And that's a great way to do it as well. And a tweet deck is a way for you to organize on Twitter um, that you can create, like you said, these sorts of channels or columns, and you can say, I'm going to have different groups. And I think, is it just maybe tweetdeck.com? I'm trying to remember. I think, it's, I think it's just that simple. And then you can use your Twitter account to create a tweet deck account. And it, you know, put an icon on your desktop and just right. pop it up, yeah. and that's the way you you use Twitter is, yeah. is by way. And of if you want to, you can send the same message to Facebook that you're posting on Twitter at the same time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So yep. what is that called? Tweetdeck. 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 T W E T D E C K. Yep. So that's another great way to do it. There are ways as well um, that different types of social media can interface with each other. So for my professional Twitter account, that updates my Facebook account at the same time. There's, a, there's an application that you can use with Twitter that allows you to connect Twitter and Facebook. And then you can choose when you post an update on Twitter whether or not you want to update your Facebook as well. So that's an easy way to do things. Um, and that for people who are trying to communicate across platforms, that's an easy way to do it. There are also ways that you can update your, your blog 
so that when you post a blog, it'll also, hey, do you want to put, post a tweet about that? Um, do you want to post that to your Facebook status? And you can do that as well. Um, I'm doing for time. Go ahead, Brian. It's, uh, it's 1240. Um, okay. Good. Do you, um, you've mainly talked about Twitter, um, a little bit about Facebook, but what about these other ones, Google Plus and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. What else should we pay attention to? Um, as far as what I'm seeing right now, I think, you know, obviously Twitter and Facebook are dominating the marketplace. Um, uh, so one of the things you have to ask yourself about is, you know, do you adopt the, the dominant medium or do you, you know, you find some other ones. Google Plus has made a real effort because they know that it's important for them to be part of this game. Um, Google Plus allows you to do several things. There's also that ability to update your Google Plus and your Twitter and your Facebook all at once, <laughs> uh, which is kind of fun. Um, Google Plus, I like the, the idea of circles, which is similar to this groups idea that they have. And Facebook, basically, as soon as Google Plus got online, they just got in the workshop and built some stuff that they tried to keep up or do even better. Um, which is what, you know, Facebook right now is extremely well capitalized but not making a lot of money yet. But they're really trying to maintain that market dominance. And so Google Plus also, again, very well capitalized as a company is trying to spend as much money as possible because they know that there's a real gold mine in this. Um, what's cool about Google Plus is that it, it, it's connected so easily with your Google account. So if you have a Gmail account and you use Google Documents to keep stuff up and you read Google News, well then Google Plus is right there and, and um, it's real easy uh, what I like about Google Plus and what I use Google Plus for is as sort of a um, a way of keeping my own sort of news feed. So if I'm reading the news and or reading a blog or reading something I want to come back to later, I'll plus one that on Google Plus and then I can come back to my Gmail account and grab that and hey, this was relevant to what I was doing. I've done it that way. There are other people who say, you know, I hate Facebook because I'm tired of all the, you know, pictures and news feeds and whatever, and I think people like Google Plus because it's relatively clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think one of the things I hear from Google Plus users who prefer that um, is the ability to create circles. So again, you can create a, I'm going to send this message out, but it's only going to go to my church members. I'm going to send this message out, but it's only going to go to my family. Uh, the circles have different, you, you have you tribes, permissions and groups in it. Exactly. You're allowed to create those. And so people can be part of multiple groups, multiple circles. Um, and once you kind of put people into those categories, um, it's real easy from that point to message and say, okay, I'm sending this message out, this one's going to everybody, this one's going to my, you know, Wednesday night AA group, this one's going to whatever. Um, and so uh, it becomes a really good way to be able to share information. But again, what, what Facebook did immediately when Google Plus went on board was they, they really ramped up their groups, Facebook groups, um, and they also created some ways that you can, you have levels of friends. You can have, you know, close friends and then friends and acquaintances and people you don't really talk to, but you might send a Christmas card and, you know, whatever other groups that you're in. People you, you wish you didn't have to be friends with, but <laughs> if you defriend them, they might not like you anymore. So I guess I better keep my friend. Um, so Facebook's also created those ways of, of, you know, creating different groups and different permissions. Uh, how many of you use groups on Facebook to help manage relationships with your church. You want to talk a little bit about that experience and what's working and what's not working at this point? Well, um, I've uh, just tried it a little bit recently. Um, once when I was, this past fall, when I was uh, teaching a course, or facilitating a course where we had a bunch of guest teachers. But um, I think that it was a good way to get out some message to a few people, but uh, I didn't have as too many too much interaction with, with the people. Um, I've since joined another group just for really for the whole church, and they're we're starting to see more conversation popping up in there, um, talking about whole church-wide events. So mm -hmm. it's a larger group to begin with. So mm -hmm. we're, we'll, it's really interesting to see that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm also, of course, also in some denomination-wide. Group, for the Holy United Methodist Church and dealing with different topics. And, and uh, those, of, since, again, when you're dealing with a larger scale, it is, you get a lot more engagement. And, and the ones that are on very focused subjects, I think, are, are probably the most, most helpful ones. There's, there's one group just for any United Methodist clergy person, and it gets into a lot of um, 
antagonistic conversation that one. Uh, people with different opinions about things just arguing with each other um, because there's just no focus to the conversation. It's just a group for a whole ton of people. And that's one of the things I really wanted to talk about as well is the, is the way in which um, virtual relationships or online relationships, how easy it is for us to dehumanize each other. Um, and you see these online flame wars and people having conversations with people that they've never met, don't really know, and seem so willing to just like completely throw each other under the bus. And um, it really concerns me, and that's one of the things that I'm hopeful that people who are in your role, who are trying to speak in a, in a way that's, that's inclusive and loving, um, you know, you can be who you are, but not necessarily have to demean other people. Um, and so part of what I hope we can do is to find ways to do that, to speak the truth and love, to do that in a way that's positive and productive. And I think what you said was super important. I just want to reiterate that the more focused and intentional your group is, um, and you can measure that in terms of, you know, a, a narrow focus. You can measure that in terms of a time limited. You know, one of the things I like to do is to say, I will be available online from one to two today. We're going to have a discussion on this topic. And you, you announce that event create the virtual event, and then you execute, and once that starts, then you know, the floor is open, the conversation can take place, and what's great too is then for those who weren't able to join at that particular time, they can come back at 3 o'clock and be like, oh, what did I miss? Oh, this is really interesting, and the dialogue can continue. So if you can find ways to kind of compress that energy, to channel that energy into you know, specific time, specific place, um, I think that's really helpful as well. Uh, the more you can, you can try to get that focus, whatever, whether it's a, a time focus or an issue focus or whatever the case might be. I hate to end this, but we, we do want to be out by 1 o'clock. There's another meeting in here. And I really, really appreciate you coming. I've learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else has as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Again. Do you have anything you'd like to say in, in closing? I don't think there's anything else I want to add, but I am curious to know, just to know, in terms of feedback if there are things that, that you'd like to continue to discuss, ways that we can continue this dialogue, because I'm oh, certainly sir, interested in that. How we can find you, aside from and yeah. you may not have to establish a Twitter account. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll certainly, so you know, let's post my contact information here. Um, <laughs> so, one easy way is my Facebook. Um, That's Ben Boss Professional Counseling. That's my professional Facebook page. Uh, you can also feel free, again, I mentioned Public Sanctuary is a place where I'm blogging, and I'd love to have you guys come and visit and hang out, um, talk about issues you know, related to community and, and faith and, and spirituality as well. Um, so those are two easy ways to reach me online. Um, and you know, it's easy to contact me that way as well, so that's probably a good place to start.